breakfast in bed for Whistler's mother. I blame it on the nuns at the convent where my mother was brought up. It's their fault I can't find my keys. Not that I've ever been able to find my keys. Even Minda, who used to come and help us and was very good at finding things. Ben dubbed her Minda the Finder. Even she couldn't always locate my keys. As a parting gift, Minda gave me one of those amazing electronic responding key rings. You just whistle and it bleeps back at you from under the sofa or behind the swing bin. My trouble is that I can't whistle, not to save my life nor to retrieve my keys. My mother forbade my early attempts to learn because the nuns had told her that ladies don't whistle. And I wanted to be, so I didn't, and now I can't. I have been wandering the house, pucker-lipped and breathless, trying to raise an answering bleep from the hidden key ring, but without success. Interestingly, it will answer Miranda whenever she emits a squeal of delight or pain. Her brother has suggested that I could pinch Miranda if I want to find my keys. Luckily, she has not worked out yet that her shrieks will operate the key ring. My friend Jill told me a tale about this gadget. Her mother had bought one for each of the grandchildren at Christmas, wrapped them up mysteriously and laid them out under the tree. On Christmas night, the youngest child, Sam, threw a wobbly and let out an ear-piercing yell and set off all the key rings. Never mind Christmas, it's Easter and we've been struggling through Lent. Young Benedict had learned that you could give up something for Lent. Not like eating or breathing, but something that you enjoyed but could survive without. Benedict thought long and hard and then announced that he would like to give up kiwi fruit. I don't know what the nuns would say. Actually, Ben was trying to be extra good. Ulterior motive, he was desperate for a transformer. A kind of complex high-tech toy. So conscientious was he in this task that he had to get up extra early, not being able to be good enough during the hours of daylight, evidently. Last Sunday, I was wakened at around 5.30 by the request, Mummy, do you have to use boiling water to make tea? I swiftly weighed the rival risks of letting a five-year-old boil a kettle or being made to drink something with a tea bag and tap water. Um, Daddy and I would like just plain cold water, I said quickly. And after what seemed like a lifetime of suspense, though it was still only 6.15, he returned with a breakfast tray for us. A small dish of Japanese cocktail rice crackers each and a slice of duck bread. That's the bread that's so old we keep it in a bag for the ducks. Spread lovingly and thickly with about two tons of brown and white chocolate spread. And a muck of brackish water spilled up from the bathroom tap. It was quite the loveliest meal that anyone has ever made me. I could have wept at his effort in making it and I nearly did weep with the effort of trying to eat it. Simon was very crafty and said without opening his eyes that he'd save his till he'd woken up and was really hungry. I fetched Miranda, who'd just woken up. It was about 6.44 a.m. She caught sight of the tray of goodies and squealed with pleasure. The key ring burst into bleeping, and under cover of the chaos, I fed most of the chocolate sandwiches to Miranda. Clever old Whistler's mother. By 7am, they'd both gone off to play. But it was difficult to settle back to sleep. There is a refined form of torture, untried by inquisitors as far as I know, that of making someone spend Sunday morning in a bed strewn with shards of Japanese cocktail rice crackers. We surrendered under the torture and bought the long for deceptive bot or whatever it's called. I suppose every generation of parents says it, but here it goes. Why doesn't Ben play with his lovely toys? He has some exquisite wooden models of cars and a boat and a fire engine hand-carved by my father. They are envied by every other lad that comes to visit us. 
but Ben still hankers for something mass-produced in Taiwan and needing four batteries. Miranda's favourite plaything at the moment is a plastic orange net bag, which she uses to carry male-shot literature on double glazing. Her other current passion is her new shoes. I have finally plucked up courage and checkbook and been to the shoe shop. She has been walking for five months in those little corduroy foot mittens, but they're not stout enough to protect against glass and stones outdoors. Oh, Japanese rice crackers indoors, come to that. First measured six weeks ago, she was just size two and a half, too small for off-the-shelf shoes. A fortnight ago, she was size three, but they didn't have an E fitting. And last week, she was size three and a half D. You see, I've already saved myself two lots of £9.99, and I was wondering how long I could hold out. It's not just the money, it's kind of one of the milestones, having your first pair of shoes. Miniature navy blue leather with shiny silver buckles. She really admires them, watching them so intently as she walks that she's liable to fall over. Off she goes, pretending to go out. New grown-up shoes, just like Mummy. Orange net handbag over her arm, just like Mummy. She purses her lips and huffs a soundless breath, just like Mummy, looking for her keys. I can see her wondering, what is the meaning of this ritual? How do you whistle, Mum? I don't know, Miranda. You may never make a lady, but I'll make sure you can whistle. Lauren McCall says you just put your lips together and